Hey there YouTube, Travis here. So we're at a pretty exciting time. The bike is assembled. We're gonna look at three things in this video. We're gonna look at the custom cylinder head. That was a donation from Graham. We're gonna look at the bolt-on intake for the Makuni VM20 from 1977 mopeds. And finally, we're gonna look at some of the machining work that Jesse had to do to make the MB5 forks work with the Honda Hobbit frame. All right, let's get into it. Okay, so for this build, uh, we received a custom cylinder head uh, from Graham Motzig. This is a casting from a Kickstart Xiling Hobbit clone motor. So, but the whole point of this is that it has a couple things that we wanted. One, just a silly amount of thin area, which is fine, I guess. Um, mostly that it doesn't have a decompression in it, so because it was off the Kickstart motor, and it's the core itself is pretty cheap, but this particular cylinder head and the machining done to it is a donation of Graham Motzing. Her Motzing? Ah, that guy. What, what he did was that he got castings from somebody else and he machined them at his place of work or to be what he claims is the a very good cylinder head design. So when we talk about cylinder head design, you're talking about primarily the combustion chamber diameter like volume, the squish band, which is this area here, the distance between the deck height, which would be the distance of the cylinder face here, down to where this edge is here, uh, the surface here, and total combustion chamber shape, and ah, there's a bunch of subtle shit, plus like the cooling factor, angle of spark plug, all this other shit. But, so he takes cores, machines it out to this head, which he has, I guess, rigorously tested in the past to be a good design. So um, we're not looking for super high compression with this motor. And we're not looking for uh, really high RPMs either, so we could run, and we're not looking for a really tight squish band, which would be the distance between this surface right here and the top of the piston. So we're not looking to really push the extremes of the power output on this thing. So we're really just trying to make sure that it stays really cool. It's less likely to actually leak any air around the cylinder head from the decompression channel, which this one doesn't have, because we're starting it completely differently. And yeah, should be a perfectly fine head. I'm actually am excited to see how it works and see how reading cylinder head temps on it work out once we actually get it assembled. So thank you, Graham Motzing, or Motzing, Graham, for donating of the head and your machine time. And we shall definitely put it through its paces on this, or he will. So I ain't doing shit. <laughs> so now that we're done with the shill section of this thing where we're talking about how awesome uh, Graham Matza ball is, we are gonna to get to the part where we actually purchased this part. So this is gonna be an honest and fair balanced review of the 1977 in-house built cast aluminum intake to use on your stock Hobbit to allow you to put a VM20 Makuni clamp or um, <clears throat> flange mount carburetor directly onto your frame. So the first thing we realized is th that casting was not that great. Like this is the, the casting on a Honda factory intake and this is the casting on the 77 intake and you really don't need this to be that hole there to be any larger than that one there because the holes in this ain't really any bigger. And since nobody sells a different reblock than this one, you're going to use this one so what's the point of making it so much larger and if you're going to do that at least make the lines like crisp and nice and have the flow of form down through here because but then when we actually got the engine into the subframe and then just just test fitting here to see how much of an issue we were going to have we realized that you know we have like just so many issues here so if we so we're going to do this let's pull air tubes out so we don't need these anymore since we're not using a carburetor so and let's see if it gets in there let's get these off there just for a sec these are gonna be in our way. Let's get these out of the way. So let's see if we can slide this down in here now. No, okay. So what else are we hitting? We are hitting, we are hitting, what am I hitting here? I have to use a slightly shorter bolt here by like five millimeters just to maybe get that clear by and then like it kind of mounts in here. Man, that's really tight. You know, if you're gonna have stuff written, be like, by the way, this is how this actually mounts in here. It's a complete bastard. 
Okay, so what I'm my, mostly hitting here, I'm sliding this down in here, is the, one of the nice things you have on these carburetors is that you can just remove the main jet from the side of it without taking the entire float ball off, which mounted like this completely null and voids that fun aspect of the carburetor. So I got, we can mount it down in here. It's just a real bastard. Um, it does fit, but just barely. Now, my review so far is that this sucks. This is unfortunate. It's pretty tight. Not tight. It's hitting, it's hitting it. it. Like people test this stuff out, right? Like when they were in the process of determining the dimensions of the part that they were going to cast themselves, at some point they probably had to stop and see if it fit a bike. And if you're gonna say something silly like, well, you should have known that you're gonna have to cut the side panel, pan like these brackets off here, to use this, then maybe, just maybe, you should write that down in the description or maybe in the instruction manual that you failed to provide. And if you're going to rotate the stupid carburetor flange mount, rotate it enough that you can actually clear the down tube of the frame, because it's against the down tube and also this bracket, which is both dumb. And if we actually had this bolted down all the way, which we don't, it would be even worse, so... <sighs> So Jesse's going to describe the creative solution for running the MB5 forks with the Hobbit head tube. So we, going with the philosophy of just using the stuff that we have sitting around, I had a set of MB5 forks that were used. Um, we rebuilt the forks, but actually putting the MB5 forks onto the Hobbit fork tube is actually not the easiest thing to do in the world. And that has to do with the fact that the fork tube for the Honda uh, MB5 is really really small in diameter so what I did was I did a couple things I took the I wanted to basically be able to not modify the frame at all or the bearing races or anything and just drop this fork assembly into this so if we needed to we could just put it on any MB or Hobbit from this point forward so I cut the Hobbit fork tube off the stem so we had the thread and diameter correctly. Putting the bottom one down on here was just a matter of sliding the original race down on here with a spacer that I just hammered in place so it was in there, so that's not gonna move anywhere. But the sliding this fork tube stem around this fork tube stem was actually kind of difficult. I ended up putting it in a lathe and turning the inside of this piece here down, making it thinner. So this stem here actually has three steps in it to get to the correct thickness, because if you look at the top here, you can see the diameter of the original fork tube and the one we put around the outside. So I had to machine the inside of the, the Hobbit one to have it stepped the exact same as the original uh, fork stem so that it went around the outside of here and didn't rotate. And the reason I didn't just cut the stem off here and weld a new one on here is because making sure that I put the stem on here square and true and the correct length and all that shit sounds like way more work. Because if you put this on, if you cut this thing off here and weld a new stem on here, it could be crooked, it could be anything. I didn't even feel like dealing with it. So the best way to do that was just to sleeve the outside of it with the original stem. So did that, TIG welded around there. I didn't do the TIG welding on this. I had one of my buddies at work do it. And the second section of this was actually getting the fork top tree. The diameter of this thing clearly wasn't going to be the same because I made it out this much larger. So I threw it in one of the CNC mills at work and then I bored this hole out to be the correct diameter. And then because the threads on this, I don't have this die to cut threads further down on here, which would have been a simpler solution, but I don't have that die. And trying to machine the threads further down on here would have also been a way pain in the ass. So the easier solution for me was just to cut material off of the top of the triple tree and make this whole section thinner so that I have room to clamp this down on here without making a bunch of spacers and having enough room on the top of the head nut so that the crown nut sits on here correctly. So now that everything is done, all you should ever have to do is just use this assembly to just throw MB5 forks into a Hobbit. If I had to do this again for somebody, I probably would do it about the same way. Um, it was not the easiest solution, but it did work pretty well. I did have to throw a lot of expensive tools at it, you know, um, CNC material and stuff like that. So it, it did take a little bit more work than the average shop can do, but I can do that sort of thing now. So it's not that big of a deal for me. So, but normal fork assembly on anything like this is, you know, you want to use a good water resistant 
long-term heavy paste grease and you want to really coat it in there you want to, if it's got bearing race it uh, cages on here you want to really kind of press it in there and get it in there and again another reason I did it like I did is because that I can just throw all this stuff in here without having to and you want to put if you have loose ball bearings which I hate loose ball bearings but a lot of bikes come with loose ball bearings you have to basically grease the inside of these of the races so that you can put the ball bearings in here um, since this is not like that we don't have to do that but as it's much easier and it costs the same amount of money to switch to a cage bearing it doesn't make any difference at all so just put a cage bearing in here so we're not going to have time to get this fully assembled today but we will but at least this part on here so but this just slides up in here now yeah, but since we're using all the original come on hobbit hardware makes things a lot easier to deal with because we don't have to worry about any of the fitment issues with the bearings and so when you're tightening down the adjustment nuts on these you really want to make sure that it's you don't have any motion back and forth or up and down so you really want to make sure that it's only you only have the motion you know the, the rotational motion and not any movement back and forth like this if you go too tight what will happen is that the forks don't want to rotate very well so you want to get at that spot right between where it rotates and where it doesn't rotate and it's not too hard to find but when you find it and you attach the crown nut on top of here it might push this down a little bit so it might change on you a little bit so once you get the rest of it assembled you might have to go back and adjust it but not too big of a deal so that's pretty much it without having cage bearings and we I put this together in such a way that spacer the original the MB5 top crown and then the I don't have the spacer for it but just for illustration purposes and then and I machined this out large enough that you can get a socket down in that well so and then it just threads down on there and then all it does is tighten down once I have everything on here so wow it's a really easy solution for this it required a lot of tools but it's going to make it a lot nicer so yeah Still very impressive, and we get to keep all the original Hobbit stuff. Yeah, and that's so that we can actually just take this and put this on any frame in the future without having to modify any of the, the new frame. And I wanted to do that just, just because it's less stuff to worry about. If I can modify less parts here, even if it might be more difficult to machine this thing out or like weld a stem onto this thing, it actually makes it less work because I don't have to screw around with the frame.